Hello Awesomeness Junkies, welcome to another episode of Hustle is for Life Motivation. I am Talal, your host, and tonight I am joined by a very special guest. Uh, tonight's guest is a, the founder of Small Pond Enterprises. Now, this is a company that works at the intersection of relationship building and thought leadership. So basically, tonight's guest uh, works with thought givers and helps them become thought leaders. And he uses the same methodology that he used for himself when he was a high school English teacher and actually ended up becoming a Broadway producer in under two years. He is also the founder of ConnectorCon uh, and the co-host of the podcast which is called Access to Anyone. And that's a podcast that actually explores how you can get to know anyone you want to be in business with and in life using everything from the latest technology to the most time-tested principles. Tonight's guest also has been featured in Dory Clark's book called Stand Out Networking, which is how I actually found out about him and just reached out because in the book, when Dory spoke about him, she talked about how he started ConnectorCon and used it as a strategy to network with really high-level people. And I just thought it's a fantastic story here that I need to catch up on. So I decided to reach out and Michael very kindly accepted. He decided that he's going to be here he's going to come on and add a ton of value to us he's an awesome person very open very giving we had a little chat before we actually started recording this and i cannot wait to get deep into this conversation so without without much further ado please help me welcome mr michael roderick on the show michael thank you so much brother for taking the time to be here with us i really appreciate it yeah thanks so much for having me <laughs> I know you're a very busy guy. You've got a 16 month old baby. Uh, you run a podcast. Yes. <laughs> you are, you know, connecting with people. You do coaching um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, you know, I generally, I'm really appreciative of the fact that you take time to be here with me uh, and to add value to the hustle community. Happy to do it <laughs> and uh, happy to chat with you guys. Awesome, Michael. So, Michael, let's let's just start from the beginning of your story because it's absolutely fascinating. You know, a high school English teacher, and then you end up becoming a Broadway producer. You're now actually, you know, coaching people, and at the same time, you're running a podcast. How how did that happen? How how do you go from being a high school English teacher to becoming the founder of ConnectorCon and Small Pond Enterprises and the the podcast hosting and everything else? Yeah, so it's kind of a it's it's kind of a crazy story. I mean, I uh, the joke that I always make is that I've lived about seven. 17- different lives i've uh, <laughs> i've i've been in a lot of different industries wow. uh and i've met a lot of people from just lots of different worlds um so what i'll do is i'll kind of just take you guys back and i'll and I'll, I'll walk you through some of the things that that happened uh so basically i i was a high school english teacher i was running the drama program at my school uh, right. so i'd always been involved in theater i'd always been very interested in theater and I was getting my master's in educational theater at the time. So I was right. learning about how you use educational theater principles and basically use theater to help kids learn uh, material. Uh, so I was really involved in that world. I was having conversations with people on the, on the theater side. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of the uh, students at these theater schools really never had anybody to like help them on the producing side there was always there was always sort of the you know the people who wanted to be the actors or the writers or the directors so i started doing that for a lot of those for a lot of those people i started kind of just helping produce these small projects and during that time um we had to raise money and uh when you have to raise money there's uh you know there it's a lot of work and and one of the things that I realized was that most people were doing bar parties and they were basically like going and like setting up at a bar and saying like, hey, come and give us like five bucks for our theater company. And it was very like very much like uh, kind of begging. Right. You were right. just like, oh, please, you know, help us. Right. Yeah. So I had this idea uh, and the idea was what if I took the theater companies and I put them in the back room of a restaurant and I took like, you know, 15 or diff- uh, different theater companies and headshot photographers and different people. And I said, 
um, we're going to host a mixer, and it's going to cost you know ten bucks to head through that whole um, have people go through that whole process of going and getting to meet all of these different theater companies, and it went over really really well. Uh, and all these companies started to get to know me. I started to get to know a lot of people in that world. So eventually, I was uh, offered the opportunity to do a training program for Broadway producers. And right. there's there there are these different training programs out there. And I remember I had gone to see a panel discussion at one of these training programs, and I saw these Broadway producers speaking. And I was leaving, and the person who ran the theater, who I knew because I had rented that theater multiple times as a producer on the off-off level, said, you know what, everybody's going to try to meet these producers, but they're going to be at our Christmas party. Right. And two weeks later, I get an invite to the Christmas party, and it's a much less crowded scenario, and I see this woman who I'd seen on the panel, and first time I had ever made an uh, like interruption in my life. Like first time I'd ever gone up to somebody who was already talking and like, you know, interrupted the <laughs> conversation. And I just came up to her and I just said, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just love what you're doing. I am very interested in producing. I'd love to learn more about it. And she turned to me and she said, you know, what, what do you do now? And I told her that I was a teacher and she was fascinated with that. She was like, Oh my God, you're a teacher. That's amazing. And we were talking about that. And then she was like, what are you doing tomorrow night? And I was like, I'm, you know, I'm on the wait list for a show. And she said, well, why don't you come with me? Uh, I'm going to go to a meeting of the Broadway League. And it was basically all Broadway producers. And it was this little cocktail gathering. And I got to meet a bunch of other Broadway producers who helped me uh, basically find out about the inner circles of these training programs. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, there are certain programs in the Broadway space that you can apply for and you can learn the logistics of producing on Broadway. So you can le learn about that process. Right. So I did one of those programs. I got an internship with a Broadway producer. While I was doing that internship with that Broadway producer, I met a bunch of other producers and I started to learn that the main thing that people needed to do in Broadway was raise money. Now, for profit, everybody in that world wanted credit uh, right. for raising that money. They wanted to have their name above the title. So what I did was I just went to other producers and I said, actually, I'm not interested in credit. I want to get better at raising money. Mm. So I don't really care if my name's on anything. I just want the deal flow. Uh, and I want to be able to reach out to people and I want to be able to say, like, would you invest in this project? So I actually started raising money and helping producers find investors without putting my name on anything uh, as a way to just learn how to do it better. Awesome. And because of that, more producers reached out to me because I wasn't asking for what every other producer was asking for. Yeah. So as a result, I ended up get building this network of producers and they came to and then eventually I was approached by one of them who said, "You know what?" You've already raised money for other projects. You've already done these things. I have this project, and I'd love for you to raise on it, and I would love to offer you credit yeah. on the show. And that was how I got my first uh, Broadway credit. Oh, wow. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. I, <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you, that's amazing because, you know, you you went straight in for the kill. You're just like, you know what? I don't care about credit. I just want to re get really good at this one skill that really matters. That one thing that really matters. I want to good at, get good at it. I don't care about the credit. Let's just work together and get on it. So, you know, no wonder suddenly people started to approach you and be like, actually, Michael, why don't you come and work with me? Because, you know you're not looking for what everybody else is looking for, which is the credit part of things, but you know, you're, you're just generally there to help. Uh, and I think for people who are watching, that's a great networking strategy right there that Michael shared with you, how you can just connect it, you know, get connected with anybody you want, but generally just trying to help them and say, look, you know, I don't care about, you know, whether you are able to give something back to me, I have no expectation, I'm just here to help you. Fantastic. You get your door, uh, your foot in the door, and then you start to build that relationship from there. And that's awesome. I love it. I absolutely love it. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, it, it truly, I mean, I absolutely believe in that and talk about it all the time. Um, and I think it's really important because, you know, I, I, I believe that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So to, mm -hmm. upgrade, to upgrade your network is really important that you kind of reach out 
from your normal kind of uh, you know network your inner circle and then start to connect with new people and learn from them and you know start actually join them in their ventures and what they're up to and, and learn about what other things are truly possible for you so that's a great strategy actually Michael uh, and thank you for sharing that thanks so sure Next thing really is, I mean, you you then started ConnectorCon. So what's the story behind ConnectorCon? Because that's that's something that Dory <laughs> actually talked about in her book, and she's she she talked about it very very highly. And she's like she is, she's attended the conference herself. She's done some workshops and some talks there, um, and she said she really enjoys going there, etc. So I, I'm wondering what what actually is ConnectorCon for people who don't know about it, um, and then how did you get started? Sure. Sure. Uh, so ConnectorCon is a conference for connectors, and it's structured around the idea of teaching what is best practice in building relationships, getting to know people, building partnerships, and, and really thinking about things from a connecting standpoint as opposed to a networking standpoint. So a connector is always thinking about who is above me and how can I help them? And they're always thinking who's below me and how can I help them? They're never thinking, oh, I'm just going to try to, you know, do things at the exact same level with all the exact same with all the exact same people. They're always reaching, you know, they're always trying to find ways to like thread people together. Um, and one of the things that I learned was that connectors are really, really important the spread of ideas and, and opportunities because your strongest results come from your weakest connections. And connectors mm. are always developing this basis of weak ties, right? So, so what I realized was that most conferences – we're focused around an, in, an individual industry, right? So if you go to a conference, for the most part, it's always going to be people from that industry. It's like, here's a bunch of tech people, here's a bunch of you know, education people, whatever it is. Yeah. And what I realized was that if you change the model and you brought people from different industries together, then you basically increase the opportunity for everybody there because you're not meeting people that you normally you normally would meet within your existing circle. Yeah. Uh, so the story of how the conference came about uh, ties to yet another life that I lived. I um, was a VP of operations uh, for an educational technology startup, Ooh, awesome. uh, and I uh, – yeah, and I worked uh, in that role for a short period of time, and then I switched into business development. And during the time that I was doing business development, they sent me to a really bad conference, okay. and <laughs> it was uh, it was this like just awful experience for me. And I remembered thinking, you know, there were a couple things that were a problem. One was that if you were wearing a name tag, and that name tag said what you did, people would look at you and basically make a, a judgment based on the name tag. So yeah. at that time, I was working for a technology company. I'm at a conference with a bunch of teachers. They would see the fact that I worked for a technology company, and they would see that I was in the sales side of things, and then they would, like, turn tail and run the other <laughs> way, right? Like, nobody was talking to me. I was yeah. like a pariah, you know, at this particular thing. And then I also noticed that whenever people would speak at the, you know, at the events, uh, whether it be that they were hosting a workshop or whether it be that they were doing a talk, these people would like not stick around, like, right. They'd be like out the door right after, or there'd be, you know, like a crowd of people and they'd talk to like maybe three of them and then like peace out. So when I got back after that experience, I was just like, you know what? I think the conference model's broken. Mm. And I think that there is there is a space for conferences to think more in the context of creating safe space because we struggle because the way that the event is structured does not create a safe space. Yeah. It basically challenges you to be like figure out it on your own and figure out like who you want to talk to of things. So I came up with this idea and I was like, if I just started a conference for connectors, you know, how many people would be interested? So I reached out to some of my friends and I said, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. And I'm just curious, like what kind of interest you have? And a bunch of my friends came back and they were like, I'll speak on a, you know, I'll, I'll speak on a panel or I'm happy to, you know, facilitate a workshop or whatever it was. Yeah. So I, uh, I remember that basically there was one day where I, I was done with the sales for the day. Um, and it was just like kind of dead in the office because there, uh, it was sort of towards, uh, towards the end of the, 
the calendar year, so there really wasn't much for us to do. Right. So what I did during that time was I just reached out to a bunch of people uh, about you know being part of the conference, and I programmed the whole conference in a couple of hours. Wow! Uh, so I put yeah, so I programmed the conference sold the conference and executed the conf- conference, the very first Connector Con, uh, in about 35 days. Oh, wow. That is amazing. That's phenomenal. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is, that's insane. Um, and th- to be honest with you, the th- that just shows the power of your network, like how amazing your network was and how good, were you, how good you were at networking that you were able to just get it done in like 35 days. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, what it came down to was, you know, I always look at when I'm meeting with people and I'm getting to sort of understand who they are, I'm always looking at what is it that they are trying to do. So I'm always sort of thinking through that. And for the most part, you know, it's like, this person can help them fill in that gap. This person might be able to help them solve, you know, this particular problem or this resource may be able to help them solve this particular problem. Mm -hmm. And what I've found is that when I, when I focused on helping other people become more successful and I really just put my attention on like, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? And I take the time to listen. A lot of the time they come back to you and they say, Okay, so now I've done this. You know what are you know what are you looking for? Uh, and you know, in this particular scenario, I had a lot of people who I had helped in different in different capacities. So they were just kind of looking for something to be able to do. Yeah. Um, because one of the things I talk about that a lot of people forget about with this whole sort of aspect of giving is that there are certain people who they have what I call a very strong reciprocity impulse. And if somebody has a very strong reciprocity impulse, they want to give back to you when you give to them. It's just like part of their nature. They mm. and and they get upset if they can't, yeah. right? Yeah. So if if you have people that you're always giving to or that you're always helping and you never ask them for anything, you never let them know what it is that you need, some of those people start to get frustrated with you mm. because they're like, why, like, what is the, you know, what is the deal? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like you don't need anything? Like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was these things where, you know, when I went to them and I said, like, I'm doing this, doing this thing, there are a lot of people who are just like, I want to be a part of it because you attract good people. Mm. Uh, and that's always been a big thing for me is my number one rule is I do everything in my power to only introduce good people to good people. If I get a bad vibe for somebody or if somebody has done something sketchy, yeah. I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how much money they make. I don't care. None of the other factors apply. If they are not a good human being to mm. another human being in my world, I don't care how connected they are, how powerful they are, they're not part of my circle. Wow, that is powerful. And, and to be honest with you, that takes a lot of courage as well, right? That takes a lot of courage to actually just mm-hmm. turn around and say, nope, nope, that's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I really, really appreciate you sharing that with us. And I think that's really powerful for people who are actually watching this. There's some real gold here. Uh, the number one thing I want to highlight is what Michael talked about, the fact that he went to a uh, conference and saw how it was badly structured. So he decided to actually create something that actually solved that specific problem and what the highlights is that when you are expecting miracles in the world and they're not showing up then it's time to be that miracle and that's what michael did he 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 actually became the miracle that he wanted to witness in the world and i i I just absolutely love that the second thing michael talked about is the the, yeah no problem man i kudos to you i mean that was that was awesome Uh, i loved it really powerful message and then again michael talked about you know um how he always is trying to help people how he's always trying to see how can i connect this person and help them with whatever it is they, they they're working on and that's again a really really powerful uh you know thing to have a really powerful uh kind of like a almost like a force that that's driving michael i believe and and then it's bringing amazing people into his life because he's out there just generally trying to help people and it's being that being genuine and being authentic that that's brought so much success to michael uh, i'm sure you'll agree michael that these these are the things that really people need to be you know living and practicing in their daily lives in order to actually get to the the high the higher end of success 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. You know, I, I, I basically look at it as everybody uh, falls on a spectrum mm. between asking anxiety and asking blinders, right? <laughs> okay. So right. everybody, you know, lands somewhere on that spectrum. And if, mm. you're, if you're concerned about asking other people and you're worried about reaching out, you're usually on the asking anxiety side and if you're if you're not concerned at all and you're just going out there and like trying to get whatever you can get you're on the asking blinder side and mm. if you're on the asking blinder side you're basically in a state of network repair right because you have to you have to spend time having conversations with people about what it is that they what it is that they're looking for because you've spent so much time asking them for for other things and trying to get you know and trying to get as much as you can mm. but the other flip side of this that a lot of people forget about especially because there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, is around sort of like give and and you know have no expectation of return and everything will work out yeah. is the fact that you can put yourself in a position where you you are over giving and you're burning yourself out. Yeah. You know, so you have to have a balance. You have to make sure that you are cultivating your relationships so that people understand who you are and what it is that you're trying to accomplish in the world as well. Yeah. Uh, so that mm. you don't just end up in this place where you're always t like doing all these things for all of these other people and you're you're so afraid to ask for anything for yourself that you actually uh, start to suffer, yeah. and you actually don't do as well. Mm. Uh, and and that's a danger that I think is is not addressed nearly often enough. I, I I like to refer to it as the giver's fix, because whenever we give, we get a we get a good feeling as a result of it. There's actually a chemical reaction that happens in our body when we give, and yeah. and some say it's dopamine, and some say it's oxytocin, and there's lots of different theories as to where that chemical is coming from and what it is. Mm. But ultimately, the core thing is that we get a good feeling whenever we give. We do not get any kind of chemical reaction when we ask. So you have people who spend all of their time giving and never actually educating people in terms of what they need and never actually asking for what they need. So like a drug addict, they basically just keep getting hit like with that high and they don't take care of themselves and eventually they, they, they start to break down. Eventually things start to really fall apart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ooh, I, I absolutely love what you said there. That is really, really powerful. Um, the fact that, you know, you, you have to actually make sure that you are not just, you know, giving, but the fact you are making other people aware of what is it that you are trying to accomplish as well and how they might be able to help you. And it's okay to ask because you have hopefully established that connection there. You've already, you know, shown the fact that you are authentic, you're genuine, you try to help them out first, you've given first. And then, yes, it then kind of gets you to a position where you might be able to do the ask. Um, but, you know, again, it's really powerful, the fact you highlighted that, you know, make sure you do ask because otherwise you're, you're just draining yourself, right? So I love that. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, the Sure. The thing, I think you, you said something earlier there, which I want to kind of go back on. You said something like your strongest results come from your weakest connection or something along those lines. Can you please expand yes. on that? Because that, that was really powerful and I, it just really hit me. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if we can go a little bit deeper there. Sure, sure. So there was a study done um, by a guy by the name of Robert Granovetter. And it was a study done uh, of college students. And the first group of college students asked their uh, close friends and family for jobs. And the second group of college students asked people that they barely knew right, for okay. jobs. Right. And the second group outperformed the first. Wow. And the reason that was stated when she sort of go through the entire study hmm. is the fact that the people who are closest to us – are in the same social circles for the most part. Like yeah. they, they, they know a lot of the time about the same opportunities, the same people and all of those different types of things. So in many cases, they're not going to know about a new opportunity for us or a bigger, or, or a bigger thing for us. Whereas the people that we barely know, the people that we've met once or twice, those weak ties, they're 
in other worlds. They're working in other industries, mm. so they're exposed to diff- completely different, a completely different set of opportunities. The other side of it that I think is really important is, and this this ties to a lot of time in investment, people talk about a friends and family round, right? And and the fact of the matter is, your friends and family are probably not going to invest in your startup. <laughs> and the reason for that is not because they don't it, yeah it, the reason for it is not because they don't believe in you right it's because they're your friends and your friendship is more important to them than anything mm-hmm. else yeah. so they know that the second that they put money into something of yours or they introduce you to some investor they've completely changed the dynamic of that relationship and one of two outcomes are going to happen either that relationship is going to go sour and they're concerned that you're going to blame them for that or the relationship is going to go so well that you forget about them. Mm. So those are two major concerns that that people in your life who are close to you have. You know, yeah. and, and it's like if you're asking a family member to invest with you or you're asking a family member to do something that's monetary – Nobody wants to be at Thanksgiving dinner and be like, sorry, I lost $50,000 of yours. Can you pass the cranberry? So, yeah. Like, not going to be a good, you know, not going to be a good scenario. Yeah. On the, on the flip side, if you're dealing with people who you've just met or you've met them once or twice and you know them more sort of tangentially, they're to taking a risk be not nearly as high of a level of reputational damage that can happen. So if I'm a hairdresser and you are trying to you know, become a famous actor and one of my clients is an agent, I don't care about introducing the two of you because it's not going to affect my hairdressing career. Mm, right? Yeah, yeah. But if I'm an agent... I might not introduce you to another agent or if I'm another actor, I may not introduce you to my agent because we're all in the same industry and there's the potential, there's the possibility of reputational damage. Yeah. And you see it in every industry where sometimes people closest to you who may have those higher end connections are not going to make those connections because they're directly tied to that person's livelihood and all those different types of things. It's completely on the outside of it and it's not tied to their livelihood they're happy to make that introduction because to them it's just i'm helping this person who i think is cool and i want to support them in what they're doing yeah yeah absolutely absolutely Uh, and again you know i think you dropped some real gold there so people who are watching this i I think you know that that one statement and then obviously michael talked about the study and explained the 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 logic and behind it of how they got the results and and what do the results mean i think that's really really powerful because you you were saying it you know just uh, doing the conversation before and but it just really hit me just stood out really hit me and i was like wow i need to go back to this i need to get michael to actually tell us what what does that really mean so thank you for sharing that that was awesome sure no problem no worries uh okay so michael the next thing is obviously you know you're you're doing a whole bunch of stuff right um i'm just wondering (laughs) if you have any kind of daily routines or any kind of like uh you know things that you do on on a regular basis that kind of help you to perform at the highest level um you know because obviously it's not easy to have a 16 month old baby and then you're running a podcast and then you're trying to sort out connector con and you're doing you know your coaching and everything else so you know do you have any any, any tips for us that you might be able to share with us? Sure, sure. I mean, I think that one of the biggest mistakes that you can make as an entrepreneur, that process can become so important to you that you don't take the time to be like, what do I need? And make sure that you're getting it. Yeah. Uh, so personally, uh, I, I make sure that I always have uh, time to meditate uh, awesome. because it gives me it gives me a, a chance to basically just kind of reset and and let my brain just kind of not be in this you know mode of like what's coming next. Yeah. Uh, so that's a really important thing. Uh, the other thing for me is I write uh, I write a daily email. So I um, so I write uh, an email every day Monday through Friday. I take the weekends off uh, and you know spend it with family and everything. But um, that aspect of writing every day 
is very, very powerful because it gets me to consistently peel back the layers of mm. any concept that I'm developing. Like anything that I'm working on, in order to be able to write every day, I have to keep thinking about it from different angles and from different points and figure out okay, how do I want this to work? How do I want this to, uh, how do I want this to be perceived? And then look at the feedback that I get mm, yeah. as a result of that. Uh, so, so that aspect of writing every day is a very powerful, is a very powerful thing. The last thing that I would say is, is important is, uh, I refer to it as paying attention to the transitions. So, uh, in directing, uh, when I used to work on shows, yeah. there would be a scene and then there would be a moment in between the scene and that was a transition, right? And in a, tra in a transition, you have to figure out how is the actor getting off stage? How is that chair getting on stage? And all these like logistical things that most of the time uh, people just kind of forget about because we watch the scenes. But if you forget to pay attention to the transitions, what happens is that the show ends up suffering. Right. Mm, yeah. So I am very, very big on making sure that in the whole relationship building process, there are I'm paying attention to the transitions. So if I'm going to schedule a meeting with somebody and I know that I'm going to have follow ups for that meeting, yeah. I'm not going to schedule my meetings back to back. I'm going to schedule the meeting. I'm going to schedule a chunk of time directly after the meeting to handle my follow-ups and to deal with my follow-ups yeah. so that I'm making sure that I do, do the things that I say I'm going to do. And one of the things that I do is I keep a, a physical notepad whenever I – and I write notes on, on people and I – put that information into a spreadsheet and I put that information, you know, when I'm sending an email and all those different types of things so that I can physically rip the piece of paper out mm. and know that it's done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, that's very, very useful because then I know that something has been finished as opposed to just kind of like sitting on a drive somewhere because one of the things that you can do that's an absolute relationship killer is to say that you're going to do something and then not actually do it mm, right yeah yeah like and and there are tons of people who are like well-meaning connectors who are like i will do this intro for you i will do this thing for you and they take weeks months some, and, and in some cases never do it and yeah. that really has to do with not paying attention to those transitions like yeah. you have to figure out where are those blocks of time for you to do the that little that stuff that you know is is a follow up that does take time but will instantly get pushed off if you're being offered the opportunity to do a podcast to you know go to a meeting to have a one on one call like everybody loves the sexy part yeah. of relationship building mm. but you know nobody really uh, you know enjoys the the logistical part of it like yeah. the scheduling <laughs> the making sure that you do the things that you say you're going to do yeah. that takes actual work so yeah. making sure that that's built into your day i think is a very very important piece that a lot of people have. yeah yeah and, and i think that's that's a really really uh, comprehensive answer that you gave about so many different things and so many different aspects uh, and how you actually manage them and I absolutely love that that was fantastic uh, and you're absolutely right follow through is everything right like once you actually commit to something you have to follow through and and that that's everything uh, so that's beautiful I absolutely love that um, Michael I'm wondering what are your main goals for 2018 and uh, where do you need help right now how can we help you right now Sure. Um, so one of the things that I am uh, really focused on and thinking more about in 2018 is doing more speaking. Okay. Uh, so I'm starting to look at you know which, which types of places it would be good good to present some of these some of these new ideas and some of these new concepts. Um, so for me, more opportunities to present this information to be on other platforms to do interviews like this to do media, you know, those types of things are really, really helpful um, in regards to just sort of the spread of information and, and, and that side of things. 
Uh, in addition to that, I really thinking through what I want ConnectorCon uh, 2018 to be. It's going to happen in December, and I'm and I'm right now in the process of really doing more research on the experience design part of it, awesome. and figuring out how I want to look at some of the things that, that I've uh, seen in a lot of live events and conference models that I haven't been necessarily happy with, and and try to continue to innovate in regards to creating uh, creating that uh, that side of things. Uh, so I'm always, you know, I'm always excited to talk to people who are connectors, who are thinking differently about this process uh, and and all those different uh, all those different types of things and find more opportunities to just spread the word about uh, about the work that I'm doing. Awesome, awesome! I, I love it. And uh, again, I'll keep that uh, you know in mind. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I, like I said before, as well, before we started recording this, I, I'll, I'll make a few intros, which I think will be will be really useful for you in terms of going on other platforms and stuff. So that's awesome. Um, and Michael, if somebody wants to actually reach out and connect with you, what's what's the best way that people can reach out to you? I'm uh, pretty active on on social media, so um, you can definitely find me on Twitter at Michael Roderick. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, that's how we connected. So yeah. you know, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm responsive on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, there's uh, I know that there are some folks who are, who are not, but I'm very responsive on LinkedIn. Awesome. Uh, and then I have. Um, my website is just smallpondenterprises.com, and if you go on there uh, and you get on the daily list, like you reach out to me, I'm I'm usually pretty good at uh, getting back to people uh, and uh, and having conversations. So. Awesome, awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate your time. Uh, you t added a ton of value to us. Um, and for people who are watching this, you know, Michael is so giving, so open. Um, and he, he did actually come on and drop a ton of value on us. So just to say thank you, I think it'd be great if we reach out to him and, and just say, Michael, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And uh, I always say to you guys, you know what? Life happens when you take action. So Michael's just given you the key keys to the kingdom of how you can reach out to him. So go ahead and, you know, just reach out and start a conversation. You don't know where it's going to lead, right? Um, and Michael's actually talked a lot about in this conversation, Michael's talked a lot about exact strategies that you can use to network and build relationships, which is something that I absolutely love. So this could be kind of like your blueprint to actually reach out to Michael, essentially. You know, it's uh, it's kind of <laughs> ironic, but you can actually use his exact strategies to reach out to him. Um, and you don't know where it's gonna go um, so absolutely I would highly encourage you to go ahead and you know make that uh, connection just reach out and start a conversation with Michael and Michael once again thank you so much for being here I really appreciate it uh, I know your time is really precious so it means a lot to me that you made time for us to be here with us today yeah thanks so much for having me it was a blast <laughs> awesome Michael thanks so much uh, and guys I'll catch you in the next one. Until then, hustle hard and make sure that you take action. All the best. See you in the next one.